Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of White House Chronicle, which is coming right up. But first, a few thoughts of my own. Unemployment. There aren't enough jobs and too many job seekers. But wait a minute. I keep running into situations where there are jobs and insufficient job seekers. I've just been out recently giving a talk to the Association of Companies that provides services to electric utilities, poles, wires, trenches, big construction, little construction, etc. And as I usually do before I have a luncheon address, I like very much to uh, ask people what it is that, uh, that they're uh, 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 interested in, what are the issues in their industry. And usually they have got complaints about raw materials or Chinese competition, any of these things which are standard. But this time, uniformly, everyone I spoke to said, shortage of labor. Shortage of labor? This, these are artisans, these are electricians, these are bricklayers, these are concrete workers. These are skilled people who work in companies that serve electric utilities. And that's very interesting that there should be a shortage of such people and that it should be the predominant concern of the industry because the electric utilities themselves, and as you know, if you watch this program regularly or listen to it on the radio, uh, is an interest of mine. And there have been severe shortages of linemen. We say linemen, but there are women who go up the poles as well. And that is a very solid job. That is a very good job. It has very good benefits. It's really quite a great career uh, with uh, uh, some danger, some excitement, and a lot of esprit de corps. So clearly, there is a disconnect between people available to work, keen to work, and the jobs. Uh, part of it is just information just knowledge, and those seeking help clearly have not done a good enough job at getting the word out. And those who need the jobs probably haven't thought that they could fit in to that environment. I'm thinking particularly of people uh, in the ghetto, of young uh, minorities. There are jobs, there are people. We need mechanisms, more mechanisms to bring the two together. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could do it in the way that now there's so much computer dating. We need easy computer recognition of where the jobs are and where the workers are. The Million Man March, which was reprised recently in Washington, the standard thing in the, in the stand-up interviews that the television did with people at the march was, we need jobs, we need jobs. There's got to be a way of bringing these two together with a happy result. I'm surprised to find that there's a labor shortage all around the electric utility industry, which there is, though. It's a good place to work, good benefits, good pay, interesting work, and lifetime security in many cases. It's worth taking some effort, if you're looking for a job, to think out of the box, as they say. I hate that cliche, but it applies now. So take a look around. There are good jobs. Today I'm going to be talking to a very important, very special woman, Mary Dimmock. She is an activist for chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis. And if you've watched this program over the years, you'll know that once a year I do a program on this subject. I also maintain a website at MECFS Alert on the subject of this disease, this very terrible disease that no one knows much about, for which there is no immediate cure. Lifelong sickness uh, goes on and on and on, debilitating and terrible. Mary, tell me how you came to be active in this field. Thank you for having me here, Llewellyn. It's a pleasure. Uh, my son became ill about five years ago after traveling through Asia after, graduate, after college and came down with an intestinal pathogen, which then led to this disease. 
and he's been... The pathogen, we'd say a bug. A bug, yeah. a bug, right, which then turned into this disease, and um, he didn't know what it was for about a year, but um, gradually became ill, had to leave his job, had to move back home, went on disability, and five years later is still sick and not able to do very much at all. Uh, what are the symptoms? For him, um, the, the classic symptom is post, called post-exertional malaise, in which all of your other symptoms are exacerbated if you do even trivial activity. For some patients, as little as brushing their teeth or toileting. Um, for other patients, they may be able to get up and walk around the house, or they may be able to go out to a store, but the activity of that can actually cause all their symptoms to get worse. The other symptoms that they have are cognitive dysfunction, is a hallmark of this disease. That, that is that you're fuzzy. You're, you're fuzzy, they properly, can't remember words. Write. For my son, it is worst. He hasn't been able to really read a sentence or two and make sense of it. This is a young man who graduated Phi Beta Kappa from college, and he now can't really read. And that, for him, is really difficult. Another symptom is orthostatic intolerance, where if they stand up, even just sitting down, their blood pressure can get out of control, their heart can race, and they have a difficult time managing their blood pressure. And there is no easy way of saying whether you have this disease or if you have some other disease with similar symptoms. No. That may go away, but in the case of this disease, they seldom if ever go away. Right. There are certainly no approved biomarkers. There are ways that experts this, in this the disease biomarker diagnose biomarker is something the doctor can test yeah. for and find out. Exactly, exactly. There are and some... And mostly biomarkers are found in blood tests or urine tests or... Blood or tests, urine tests. There is a, something called a tilt table test, which is used as a marker of orthostatic intolerance. So there are different ways that you can actually test but in the medical society, in, the, in mainstream medicine, they don't use any tests at all. They look for the presence of fatigue. And this is actually part of what's created the controversy about this disease, because there are no accepted ways to diagnose it. In the past, it's been a diagnosis of exclusion. This program, White House Chronicle, mm -hmm. likes to include what the government's role should be. Right. And the government's role here, yeah, by omission rather than commission, it's very controversial, am it's I correct? It's very controversial. And it's been very controversial for many years. Uh, about 30, in 1988, they renamed the disease to be chronic fatigue syndrome. Instead of myalgic in encephalomyelitis. Instead of myalgic encephalomyelitis. But more importantly, they, uh, that created disbelief, but more importantly, they established a definition which only requires that patients have fatigue and not that they have the the hallmark post-exertional malaise. It also allowed patients to have primary psychiatric illness even if they did not have the post-exertional malaise. And what that has done is created a waste bin, if you will, of a lot of Which diseases. part of the government? Main, CDC. The, the Center, Center, for, Center Disease for Disease Control. Control. NIH also National was Institutes involved. National Institutes of Health. Right. And who's researching this? Who's looking for a cure? <laughs> There hasn't been very much done at all. The Institute of Medicine issued a report in February of this year where they said there's been a paucity of research outside the areas of psychiatry and there's been remarkably little research funding. And as a result, there's only five million spent a year by the NIH on this disease. Out of, of the a, enormous out of federal budget, budget right. five million dollars. Five million out of 31 billion. Now what's important to realize is this disease has an economic impact of 19 to 24 billion dollars a year, which is 42, roughly 4,200 times as much as the NIH spends each year on research. Why has it been so reluctant to put its money where it should? There's a lot of reasons for that. For one thing, the disease became psychologicalized, meaning that it, by and large, across mainstream medical and research was assumed to be a psychological disease. And there is an active group out of, primarily out of England, that has researched it as a psychological disease. And their perspective is that this disease has been caused by patients developing a fear of activity. And as a result of that, they become deconditioned. And then they have symptoms that are associated with this disease. 
And that has driven a lot of the research that's been done. And so that has, number one, that has caused people to disbelieve the disease and believe that it's real. The other factor that's played a big role in this is that NIH has consistently not provided any funding. And the advisory council that has advised the, the NIH and HHS on this has requested more money because what has happened because of the lack of money is that researchers have stayed away. They can't get money, they're going to go someplace else that where they can get money. That is an issue that this program has examined before. Right, right. Not always about medicine, but where the government doesn't provide money and it should, or it provides it and takes it away, the talent doesn't come. The talent uh, doesn't come. Uh, why would you go in a disease that is poorly financed right. and where after two or three years of intensive labor, uh, suddenly there's no money and you have to find a new job? And this is a really well-known problem um, that a number of researchers and advisory committees have raised. The other issue, which is a huge issue in this disease, is NIH is organized into institutes. And those institutes are responsible for defining their strategy for each of the institutes and prioritizing where they are going to spend their money. In the case of this disease, it's been exiled outside of all the institutes. It's an orphan, essentially, outside of all the institutes. So if the institutes are the ones that decide where to spend money and you're not part of an institute. So where, where does it, what little there is, the five million dollars, where does that endeavor reside? What happens is that um, the Office of Research on Women's Health is where this disease resides and it but goes to But men get each. this as well as women. Women get this as well. Men get this as well. My son got this. But what that office does is it doesn't have a budget for this disease. It has to go to the other institute, to the institutes, to try to get them to spend some money. How come this structure, and why doesn't the head of NIH, Dr. Collins, do something about this? <laughs> it's a very good question. The CIVSAC in um, August of this year. CIVSAC is this, this advisory, advisory committee. committee. Right. They recommended that it be put into the National Institute for Neurological Diseases but nothing has happened yet. We're certainly hopeful that that would happen. The other institute that needs to play a key role in this is the Institute for Immunological Diseases where AIDS is housed right now because that institute, each of them have provided a small amount of funding but not nearly enough to drive the kind of research that needs to be done to make advances in this I know disease. something about and the reason I have worked on it and why there is a, a YouTube channel which we're mm -hmm. putting that address on the screen now so that people can look at it and for the benefit of our radio listeners, ME for myalgic encephalitis, mm -hmm. CFS for chronic fatigue syndrome, alert for alert. Mm -hmm. uh, go and look. Uh, we've done more than 80 short films and you see some of the terribly sick people talking and some of the doctors who express their frustration, their difficulties. So I think you'll find it interesting if you're interested in how the government picks and chooses losers, and it's chosen this disease to be a loser for no known reason except that it's a difficult disease, and it has no lobby. There is no association, Mary. Most diseases have a lobby. You see people walking around Congress with armbands and holding right. press conferences. This one, because people are so very sick uh, that they can't really get there and express themselves, I suppose we should mention this extraordinary exception to somebody who's managed to be very sick and productive is Laura Hillenbrand, who wrote two bestsellers and yet can't leave her own house, she's so sick. Right. Uh, which is confusing to people because if she can produce these great books, how come she's so sick? But she is. Uh, and it, it's an act of will on her part. Well, I think also recognizing how long it likely takes her to do something in Patients may be able to do something, but they have to stretch it out over a very long period of time, be very careful not to exacerbate their illness. Uh, I wanted to come back to one thing you mentioned. In addition to how sick patients are, and I've worked with a lot of patients trying to do advocacy efforts, and they're just too sick to be able to do much. But the other thing that is really an uphill battle with this disease is the stigma that this disease has. The stigma and the, the, the fact that families don't understand, and that people they don't are providing believe. care. The caregivers get fatigued year after year right. after year. I have an enormous accumulation of emails from around the globe from people who suffer. And uh, mm -hmm. some of these are 
one woman says, I hope I don't wake up in the morning. I pray God every night that this may be the last night I go to bed. Others, there's a very high rate of suicide and other similar expressions. And many say, well, my husband left, but I can't blame him. I was no wife to him. And likewise, men who are in deleterious uh, situations. One of the difficulties I have is right. people who phone me and say, who should I see? They think there's a pill. Uh, and right. that's very difficult. What do you say to somebody? Uh, you're going to be sick for the rest of your life, probably. Uh, I'm going to take a little break yeah. for station identification and we'll come right back. Uh, this is Llewellyn King and the program you're listening to is White House Chronicle. We are identifying ourselves primarily for the benefit of our wonderful listeners on Sirius mm -hmm. XM Radio, the POTUS channel, channel 124. The audio from this program is broadcast four times every weekend on that channel. Also, we can be seen around the globe on the English language stations of the Voice of America and on 200 American television stations. Our guest is Mary Dimmock, an activist for chronic fatigue syndrome, also known by its older name, a myalgic encephalomyelitis, mm -hmm. whose son is grievously affected and who has given up her own career, which we'll talk about in a moment, for the purpose of trying to help people who suffer from this monster, monstrous disease, this nasty disease that takes a life and puts it in a dungeon and doesn't let it out. I uh, actually want to follow up on the point you just made, if I could. In addition to the stigma, there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding about this disease in the medical community, even today, even after the IOM report, which talked about... Institute of Medicine. Institute of Medicine report, which came out in February, which talked about the debility of this disease and the biological underpinnings of that debility, especially in terms of um, impairment of how the body produces energy. And yet a recent article, which was generally favorable to the IOM report, still said that it's important for patients to avoid this disease becoming a lifestyle. This disease, no patient would choose this as a lifestyle. This is a life sentence. I got that into this because have. a very close friend of mine who I hadn't seen in many years, and when I did see her, she was in terrible, right. had suffered terribly. Uh, she had been at the peak of a young life, successful in Wall Street, successful in her life in every way, an athlete, uh, and she was uh, just debilitated. Just luckily, she had some financial resources so she wasn't sleeping in the street as some mm. people are. Mm. Uh, don't forget I've had letters from people or about people who've slept in cars because right. and nobody believes them. Their families don't believe them. In some ways it seems just from my correspondence that the men are worse off because their fathers tend to say, oh you're malingering. Hi, get out there. And there's one lady we both know whose son actually died because he tried to beat it by exercising and killed yes. himself. Yeah. Uh, by accident, he was 15 years old, and he thought, I will be a man, I will exercise, I will beat this with exercise, a truly yeah. terrible situation. Mary, tell me about yourself. You were working for a pharmaceutical company, you understand something about pharmacology and how, how research organizations work. Uh, mm -hmm. how, do the, how does Big Pharma, the big companies, how do they pick a disease? We, the lay people, tend to think mm -hmm. that they're dedicated scientists, they're working on every possible ailment. It's not so, is it? No, it's certainly not so. Pharmaceutical industry and pharmacy, pharmaceutical industry as a business is a really risky business. You have a disease that you don't know how to treat, you may not know a lot about it biologically, you're trying to find a compound that's going to have efficacy going to have an effect on that disease but not cause side effects and be at a reasonable price to be able to create. Let's tell people what it costs to develop a new medicine. Oh, billions, billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Just billions think about dollars. that. Billions of dollars for a pill, for a, a what they call an infusion, something that's put in the vein. We take it for granted. We get it from the pharmacy if it's for us. It might have cost billions to develop and to go through this testing procedure and that because be there have been terrible mistakes. Right. Years ago, I mean, 
more than 50 years ago, there was thalidomide, but I'm told the specter of that, that drug hangs over the pharmaceutical world because children were born without limbs. It was given to pregnant mothers, and it was just unknown, unanticipated, and disastrous for the pharmaceutical business. Well, and a drug can be killed, quote, killed, at any point in the pipeline. So you can be very far along in phase two, phase three tr trials. Phase two, phase three being very, phase three especially late stage prior to approval and have a drug killed. So it's a risky proposition. And at a meeting for this disease in 2013, um, the FDA officials that were there, as long as some, as well as some reps from the industry, pointed out that this disease doesn't have a definition. You don't know who the patients are. The definitions are very poor. Um, you don't have a way of measuring, a defined and agreed upon way of measuring that the drug is actually causing an effect. It's called the outcome, a way of measuring the outcome. And one of the pharmaceutical companies told a rep at the FDA, or a, a member of the FDA, that because the definitions were so wishy-washy, they couldn't be assured that the insurance companies would actually even pay for the drug once they developed a drug. So they have to be concerned about whether they're going to be able to How get reimbursed. How long does this take? How long does this take? It depends on what part of the pipeline you enter in. It can be 10 years, depending on when you enter in. If you already have an approved drug, it could be less time. But if you're trying to remarket an approved drug for this disease, it could be less time. There's a drug that is being used right now called Rituxan. It's in clinical trials in Norway. The first sign of efficacy, I believe, was in a patient in the 2003 time frame or so. They published their first, if I remember the timeline correctly, their first, pub their first clinical trial in 2009. There's another clinical trial in 2011, and they're in a phase three clinical trial now. So that's a long time. Now, they had to contend undoubtedly, I would guess. I don't know all the details on it, but getting funding for it. Um, but that was a cancer drug. And that this was, was a cancer drug. So-called off-label use. Yes. Where it was found maybe to work for something other than for what it was developed and prescribed. The actual original patient had a, had a positive effect to another drug, which led them to try this drug. This is a cancer drug. It's also used in rheumatoid arthritis. There's one other drug I've heard of, and, mm -hmm. and that's called Ampligen. Uh -huh. uh, I know several people and, uh, who are helped by it and who cannot walk without it and can right. have a, it takes, you have to be close to one of the very few doctors who administers it, and uh, uh, you have to have, I think it's two hours a week or something to get this drug right. by infusion. Right. Um, I've been to one of those clinics and seen the patient sitting there with the drip. But there are only about 100 people in the whole country getting it out of maybe a million sufferers. That is appalling. Why isn't Ampligen more generally available? Well, Ampligen is not approved. So you can't the, get it even off-label yeah. from anybody. You have to go to certain clinics. Because of the way it's administered, it's an infusion every week. You have to go, so, and I think it's twice a week, actually. Um, twice a you week, You have yeah. to move to a location where yeah, that exists. There are people who have moved to, to. Right, and sometimes without their family. To Nevada, to, because there's a doctor there, Dr. Right. Daniel Peterson, a, right. a hero in this industry. On an, and on well, top of. industry is the wrong word to use, community. Right, right. The way that it's being administered right now is called cost recovery, which means the patients have to pay for the cost of drug. Cost of drug and administering has been about $20,000 a year. The price of the drug itself has just gone up, where they've announced that it's going to go up 267%, which means some patients will not be able to afford it. Additionally, if I remember correctly, if I understand correctly, only 100 people are allowed to get it because of the, um, there's a constraint on how many people the FDA will allow to get the drug. Why is that? It's because of the way that this drug is not yet approved, and so there are um, So there's a catch-22. Regulatory... If you're very lucky, you can get it and have a, some sort of normal life. If you're very unlucky, which is there most patients, you're, you've had it. And there's very no, there's no uh, medical tourism, is there? There's no country you can go to to get these mm. drugs, is there? And not that I know of, no, because nothing's been tested for this disease. 
There are some patients, my son is one of them, who have been able to get rituxan, but it's very, very expensive. In this country, it... Mary, what does it cost? I think... Uh, forty to 60000 with the cost of infusions and the cost of the travel for And the you first have to year. travel to where it can be... Uh, we had to travel to where it could be administered. And it helps him? It has helped. Before he went on rituxan, he was in bed for all except about a half an hour a day to be able to get up and go to the bathroom and use, get some food that someone else has prepared. Otherwise, he was in bed in a dark room not doing anything. I have uh, seen people in the dark room. One little girl I interviewed, young girl, I felt so sorry for her that she'd never have in her life any of the normal pleasures right. of the teenage years, uh, who we had to lift out of the bed because she was too proud to be filmed in the bed and put her in a wheelchair and sat up right. to talk to us, which was very noble and proud of her. But the effects, not only on her, but of this disease on her family were enormous. Uh, her, they are, her stepfather they are enormous. was trying to provide, trying to earn a living. Her mother also had the disease, one of those fairly rare examples of two in a family, and he simply couldn't cope with the housekeeping. Um, he wasn't, right. It wasn't dirty, but it was so much had to be done uh, and wasn't done. It was heartrending. And to think that the government was not doing its share. My own experiences of trying to deal with NIH, and I'd be, love to hear from them, once on this program had one spokesman who said, well, you don't have enough people apply for research. We don't have any money. What's the point? This is a <laughs> circular argument. This is and, and then one doctor I wanted to interview uh, on television, of course, uh, they said, well, she will uh, do it if you, on the telephone, if you write out the questions. Well, I don't write out questions. It's against the basic concept of journalism. And you cannot do a television interview on the telephone. It was preposterous. Uh, we and year in, year out, I've been doing this for five years. No word out of any of the government departments. And this is a catch-22 that we've been in for a long time as far as research. There's other issues as well, but as far as research, you don't have enough. Uh, the point that they've made is there aren't enough researchers interested. The applications that are being submitted are low quality. But I want to just, we have yeah. very little time left. How yeah. about Dr. Ripken in New York? Right. Lipkin, <laughs> Lipkin, who is the, the top virus hunter in this country, can't get any money from the government, so we've all been eating chilies. So yeah. uh, this equivalent of the, of the well, right. iced water challenge right. to get enough money for him to continue Ian Lipkin at Columbia. That is monstrous that the government won't fund his research, but when there's a crisis like Ebola, they grab him because right. he's the top man. Right. The other thing that recently happened is a group of 27 researchers, some were Nobel laureates, some were Academy of Science members, wrote a letter to Senator Mikulski saying, we would apply, but there's no money for this disease, and that's why we're not applying, because NIH has not issued an RFA. That for is this shocking. Disease. That is appalling. And that, unfortunately, is the end of our show for today. Until next week, cheers. Mm -hmm.